Welcome to the Talberg Foundation podcast series, New Thinking for a New World. Host Alan Stoga welcomes leaders from around the world to explore the issues that are challenging and changing their societies. From climate change to democracy under siege to geopolitics and beyond, we are looking for ideas that can make all our lives better. Over the past year, we have all been forced to put our lives on hold or online. Work, education, entertainment, exercise, almost everything has largely moved from the real world to the virtual world. And I think it's fair to say that most of us are unhappy with the results. Today, we're going to talk about that transformation with someone who has worked in very practical ways to find better outcomes. My guest today is Mark Mitten, a world-class magician and one of the most engaging performers I have ever witnessed. Mark's magic is phenomenal and his ability to move an audience even more so. Welcome, Mark. Great to be here. That opening was a setup, of course. Actors, singers, musicians, athletes are all engaged essentially in a monologue with their audiences, but magicians, or at least great magicians, need a dialogue. They need to engage with people almost physically to make their magic work. So let's start there. How do you, a great magician, do that through a computer screen? I guess one way to think about magic is You have magicians like big stage illusionists that do very large tricks for audiences and and even mind readers who fill the Broadway stage with scripted material. Then you also have magicians that perform in smaller settings that are closer to like living rooms or parlors. And then you have like intimate uh, performers that perform at at parties and dinners and things like that. And partly because I I really love the art of it, that last kind of magic is called close-up. And you're absolutely right. The whole thing about close-up magic is that it's interactive, it's interdependent, and that's the whole key to it. It works best when the audience feels like they are truly changing the performance and miracles that they just think of have happening suddenly miraculously happen before their eyes. I guess one way to think of it is that it's a interdependent communication model that's very sophisticated because it goes from tracking audiences that are just bored or confused to audiences that are uh, just, you know, flabbergasted and complete shock and wonder. So you, you, to be an effective uh, close-up magician, you need to track that very wide range. So how do you do that? You can do that in three dimensions when you're with people, but you've been forced to rethink this and try to do it in two dimensions, uh, which is tough, but it's the same for a teacher. It's the same for a minister who doing his church online. Um, how do you, as a close-up magician, do the voodoo you do? Well, where do you turn? And what's funny is I've actually, you know, I have a lot of friends that are professors in um, like psychology and mathematics and neuroscience. And we have been, <laughs> that's what we've been talking about. In terms of sources, I guess they've let me know that I have kind of an unusual array of sources. I've been studying the Twitch streamers that play games online very carefully because they understand streaming um, video through the internet better than anyone I've seen. They also have the excitement of the game that they need to catch up. They're also tech savvy. Um, And you're right about streaming church services. They're excellent to study. I mean, um, on YouTube, you'll find it's not obvious for educators and presenters to go there, but what you see is a very, very wide range of technical sophistication. That's what's really exciting is that you see Twitch streamers and ministers and politicians and, uh, you know, like a wide array and performers like magicians. Some answer the same problems very simply by actually limiting what they're attempting to do. And then others add a lot of bells and whistles. And ultimately, it becomes a balance between, you know, what you choose as a goal. But you're right. I guess from the beginning, my my real goal has been interdependence. Like, how do I get as much information as possible from the audience? And can you do that through this, through the mediation of this screen? Can you do it in two dimensions? Obviously, it's different than doing it in three dimensions. Yes. And and I constantly compare the where we are right now with Zoom communication and other platforms to um, like movies in the 1890s and television in the late 40s, early 50s. I actually, I've gone back and watched. For magicians, we all know that George Méliès in Paris, famously the Lumiere brothers really started film, but it was George Méliès who really kind of 
quickly conquered the field. I, I, I'd even argue beyond Edison because he had a magic theater. His specialty was actually none of the kinds of magic that I just mentioned. His specialty was the magic play. So he was used to combining special effects with story. And it put him in an incredible place to consider film. So often he gets credit for creating the special effect. He doesn't get credit for creating the effect right? With understanding what an effect is, what counts, what doesn't count, what moves an interaction forward, what doesn't. And I think that concept actually is something that's very useful from the magician's repertoire to simply track like what actors sometimes call a beat. Like when does something happen or doesn't happen? And are you tracking it or not? Let's go back to uh, the transition from radio to TV, because what occurred to me we're, we all complain about Zoom fatigue, and we all blame the tool. And I have been wondering if that's a mistake, that it's not the tool, but how we're using the tool. In the same way that you just alluded, early TV was no more than a camera stuck in front of a radio script reader, and they didn't move. They just sat there and read their script. Are we using this thing, whether it's Zoom or Teams, or it doesn't, doesn't matter, are we using this medium too simply. Have we not rethought how to interact with each other through this intermediation? I, I think you just said the answer is yes. We are doing it wrong. Well, I mean, I think it's, I think the big thing is to open ourselves up, right? And like, um, be very frank about our mistakes. Like I got on a call where I carefully planned a 15 minute show and it was too long. And uh, for the, the format that suddenly I was performing it on. But then I didn't have I didn't have a way of communicating to the host to let them know that from my perspective, that I will be stronger for you if I do five to seven minutes instead of doing the 15 minutes that we plan. So then actually not having the backstream communication to make the correction. And I sensed that he was getting the same, I mean, actually I checked afterwards and he was getting the same information, but then we had no way to communicate between ourselves to say, the plan that we made isn't effective, let's change now. So after that happened, like that's one thing that I insist upon is having some kind of extra stream of communication with the other presenters or the people organizing the event. Like I, I just did an event where we, we featured a, a prominent person in the magic world who's older and, and an incredible um, legend in the field, but doesn't really have the tech skills. So we sent in a young, a uh, person from the film industry that could make her look good and sound good. And she was kind of invisible in the background. But in addition to all of that, she was also a source of uh, communication that let us know, is this on track? Is it not on track? You know, it, it's a, a concept I have from live shows called emergency backups, right? So when something goes wrong, what do you do now? And, and normally I walk on stage with a, a, a very large array of emergency backups. And um, I kind of feel like in in this kind of communication, it's so new that we all need backups. You know, we need that plan, but we also need to write the, the counter plan. What if this isn't effective? What if my audience is bored? Then what, you know? And, and then uh, or what changes can I make within an acceptable range that all of us will go along with it? And they'll you know what I mean? Like not go too far outside of the range. It's all, it's a very delicate balance. Well, boring is boring. And whether it's in three dimensions or two dimensions, boring is boring. And you're a performer. Keeping the audience engaged is fundamental. And as you just said, you have, if you go on stage and you start in one direction and it's not working, you can easily recover and go in another direction. I've seen you do that. I've seen you reverse direction because it, it simply isn't working. Online, part of the problem, of course, is the feedback is less immediate. It's less direct. It, 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 it's less tangible. Even if you're looking at a whole bunch of people, it's less direct. So over the last year, as you have adjusted your own performances, your own communication online, what have you learned? What works? The, the best summary of what we were just talking about is actually the old Mike Tyson line, which is we all get a plan till you get punched in the, the face, right? And I, I, I think what I've learned is that what's interesting is you actually have to plan the way to get the information that can be painful. 
you actually need to put as much effort into getting the feedback, you know, to make the extra call afterwards to say, how can we do that better next time? And um, early, like, um, I have a lot of magician colleagues, and I noticed that some of them jumped on immediately with shows for uh, children. That was really brilliant because it forced them, and and then I started doing it too, just for friends, you know, children, basically because children demand in interaction, right? And they're really good at giving feedback, and so that might not seem obvious, but that was incredibly educational to say okay, I'm not where I should be. What tools do I need? How can I change my camera? How can I change my lighting? How can I change my microphone? What kind of sources of, you know, can I get like a, a background uh, stream in Discord or uh, Slack or uh, WhatsApp so that in real time, I can communicate to the other people running the meeting so that we, we can adapt in real time. One of the things you just said is, Im extremely important. Most people just turn the damn machine on and start their meeting or start their lecture or start their whatever they're doing online. And what you've just said is that is one of the reasons for Zoom fatigue or Zoom failure is we don't give enough thought to things like lighting, things like the quality of the sound, things like uh, the images that are being projected. Um, this whole work from home notion that, oh, it doesn't matter what you look like is probably part of the reason that this communication is less effective than it could be. You're absolutely right. And I wanted to jump back. You talked about a really important transition that I actually haven't studied, but I've referred to a lot in my mind. You referred to the transition from radio to TV. Uh, I studied with an old magician by the name of Contino Marucci, who went by a stage named Slidini. And part of our training was every night at 11 o'clock, we'd watch Jackie Gleason. And but because he couldn't get to what he really wanted to show me, which was Jack Benny. Right. And uh, but Jack Benny, he'd say he'd actually sit there like, a you know, a football uh, announcer describing a play with where the coach draws the lines. And he would sit there at the television as Jackie Gleason and and uh, his whole crew were making plays, right? And he would be drawing the play. And he'd explain, this is bur what you're watching is the tradition of burlesque. The reason that Jackie doesn't need to rehearse like he famously didn't was because they know these plays. Like right now they're doing this one, let me show you. But he said, the master you want to study, and then eventually I was able to get video to him, um, thanks to Dick Cavett, I should say, who, who supplied a, a VCR, we, we got tapes from Jack Benny. Jack Benny is actually quite exceptional. He was number one in radio, and he then shifted to television, and he was number one on television. And then Freddie de Cordova, his, his, uh, one of his producers, the later producer, then ran the Johnny Carson show forever. This is ancient history by modern standards. But what's, what, what's to be learned, if you listen, he's got four writers that are writing for him. He's got a producer that's producing him. He's creating a context. Uh, and they knew from radio exactly what personality traits within, within Jackie Gleason were loved. They could amplify those. And then when they wanted to do that visually, they had the same four writers that then could then make the transition. So yeah, you're absolutely right. I guess what I'm saying that is there's a lot of homework to be done to present on, on camera. And it's, it's, it is worth study. But that's fascinating because, as I said a moment ago, most of us literally just turn on the, the computer and start talking or meeting or whatever without having thought carefully through how to communicate. And what you're saying is, is clearly greats like Jack Benny. And very few people made the transition from radio to TV, from TV to the movie screen, et cetera, et cetera. And they just, the assumption that it's all the same is clearly wrong, although there are lessons always to be learned is clearly right. You're right. I mean, another great example is Bob Hope because he goes, he goes from stage to radio to like his laughs per minute are an amazing, that, that comedians think in terms of like how many, it's the equivalent of a magician's beat but, or, or effect. Like how many laughs are you getting per minute? And if you listen to his, him on radio, it's amazing. And he does television, but he actually transitions it, He's already a film star by then, but but it's the the process, and then he never gave up live performing, you know, and and that's quite interesting as well. And and I think part of it was 
it's just hard to beat live performing for the feedback, right? And so like, I'm actually thinking of that all the time on Zoom, like how can I get, how can I learn just a little bit more about what, what did not work? Some of it though is inevitably the platform itself. How could we get more engagement? Cause that's what we're all trying to get is engagement. What's really exciting. One thing I would encourage, like really great advice <laughs> is to know the tools, right? And to study what's possible. So for instance, um, if you have callers, if you're setting up a call, encourage them to update the whatever software they're using to get the latest version. Because all companies right now are in this business. They're like, so for instance, the, the, in when we started, you could only highlight two people on some platforms. Now, I think uh, some of the platforms are up to like nine people. And by that, you can you can point them out and you can highlight them and then they have a special status, right? Then also there's really big questions. Your viewers can watch in speaker mode. So that allows the person running the meeting to have more determination over what they're watching. And then there, there's also webinar views where you have complete control, but then the, in terms of from the presentation standpoint, you can kind of define the picture as you like it, but then the cost for that is that the audience can feel less engaged. So like what I've done in some big meetings is we've started in webinar mode and then we've had an after party in speaker mode, so which allows much more active engagement. It also, there's sometimes you get feedback, there's all the problems that go with it. But actually, the if you think about it, that's not necessarily a bug. <laughs> You know, if you're if you're looking for interaction and problems happen, that's not bad because the people know that it's live and that communicates its own uh, power. It, in other words, people can tolerate a certain amount of mistakes if they know that they can speak up and they can really be there. And just because somebody else like them is making a mistake, they have patience for that. Just so long as it's when it's their turn, they can make a mistake too. And they can get up and, and ask the speaker or the presenter what they want to ask. So I do think that it's really important to understand these tool sets, like, like what a webinar is and what a, uh, a speaker setting is and what a meeting setting is like and how we can use these to maximum effect and kind of help you know, different kinds of like, for instance, I, I did a big thing with a Broadway showcast a couple of weeks ago and we put it on webinar mode and we pre-recorded a lot of the music because they really care about it. And then actually one of the singers uh, who actually did the first live song had a problem. But what's funny is that was the most powerful moment in the whole show because people could see a person have a technical problem and he, his, basically his back, backing track went out and he just sang his heart out. And suddenly you're in this intimate situation with a Broadway singer that's like led the Lion King for you know 10 years and now he's with you and it's, he's just singing to you. It was an amazing, intimate moment. It was just incredible. And that's what we are missing in the way we are doing most of these conversations, most of these uh, educational, you know, teaching moments. It is, it's not hot, it's cold. And bringing that heat to this medium strikes me as, as the biggest challenge. And you just described an example when it happened, uh, accidents are sometimes good things to have. Like that was in, in webinar mode and it was much more controlled, but still then all of a sudden it was visceral and it communicated, you know, actually, you know, then one of his friends got on with him and they described, you know, famous problems on Broadway that where they had trouble, you know, with very large live audiences and in, in big shows like, you know, Hamilton and things like that. And it was just amazing, right? Because basically people got real right away. You could kind of see it in the, People were, people were thrilled, you know? That is, at least in my world, my biggest frustration with this medium, which is people tend to be more passive or maybe even more passive than they would be in a meeting or in a large room. Uh, and breaking through that passivity, getting them into the moment, which you have to do to be successful in what you do, uh, is the biggest challenge, it seems to me. Like one thing I, I do encourage everybody to do, it sounds funny, is if you have a group of friends that you'd meet for lunch with anyway on a regular basis, try to set up a weekly call, you know, and have different people lead it, you know, because then like uh, actually that happened a few weeks ago. 
Susanna was actually suddenly popping up picture in picture. <laughs> she was doing all these video effects in this open broadcast software during a regular call that I have with friends. And I just said, you know, pardon me, you know, like Susanna's playing around. Is that OK? But we all know each other and they're like, oh, sure. You know, so one thing is to take advantage of is simply that don't be afraid to get on Zoom with your friends or, you know, whatever platform you're using and just just talk, you know, because then. Um, like one thing when you're developing material in, you know, like as a magician or as a singer, like one thing we always talk about, where are you going to be bad? Where will you fail? Right? Because if, if you're doing material that is interactive, when you first do it, you really don't know. You know, I, I used to perform in downtown theater a lot for this purpose. And there was this great show called Yikes. The, the guy that wrote the movie Ants, the, the animation, he led it. And uh, I cannot think of his name right now, but it was a, and a guy named Bob Zakoriak, a cartoonist. And it basically, it was like a living cartoon. And what was so great about it is that you you had to do something new and you could only do three minutes. Right. And uh, yes, yeah, so it was Bob Zakoriak and Todd Alcott. Todd Alcott is the guy that wrote the movie Ants, which was an animated film. It was kind of like a Woody Allen ant adventure. And uh, also James Urbaniak, the, these great downtown guys. He went on to become a very successful actor in New York and L.A. But we would play together and we get these huge audiences and we'd only do three minutes, you know, and, and that's where I, and we might do several three minute bits, but we were all trying new stuff that we just wanted to try. And we all created so much material that way. But it, it is great to have a place to be bad, a place to hit the button on Zoom and have it not work or go to hit your volume button and no one hears you. And if you're with friends, that's not so bad, you know, and, and actually what's great is if you just have a five person call, you'll learn all the skills that you need to run a 300 person meeting. That's what's amazing about it, right? Well, there is an upside to this technology, which is that, which is it is an infinitely expandable audience, more or less. Uh, it can be global which is terribly important at a moment when we're all becoming rooted to where we happen to be hunkered down. So the, the opportunity to reach anywhere, which this gives us, instead of a, a limitation, it's an enormous upside. It's an enormous potential use of this technology. If we can figure out how to make it, as I said earlier, hot, not cold. It, it, it's still too cold, it seems to me. Well, I think you're right. And it, part of what makes it hot also is if you have, like you were just reminding me now of a mathematician friend who's a bit, that I had the honor of um, assisting with a math and magic class at Princeton and that we hope to uh, you know, do again a future. But um, what was so exciting, also we also did another version of it at the math museum. And, and I was just assisting him with the magic side and he was teaching the math, but he's a big deal mathematician. He won the Fields Medal and he's one of the world's great number theorists. And um, so we were talking about it and we had planned to do this course at Princeton last fall. Uh, and, and then this happened and he was teaching a number theory course. And when we talked, uh, the, his first shock was he loved it. And he loved it because he did have his class at Princeton, was, which was both for uh, undergrad and graduate students in number theory. But he also had like 50 people sitting in from all over the world, suddenly people that Wanted to, you know, like so, for instance, when he won the fields, they built an institute for him in India, and so normally he'd have to travel between those two places, and then a number of people from the institute could just jump jump on the the class, and he felt like his time was being much. So, so what I'm saying is, if the person's right, right, then the heat's there because people want to hear their ideas anyway, and then he's become an amazing Zoom presenter um, for many many reasons. He also worked on a uh, educational um, reform for India. And he's basically been able to introduce, you know, actually COVID and this crisis made it possible for the, the political groups to align and for him to roll that program out with a series of very effective meetings for basically all the major educational institutions. And, and they were all able to meet over a, in a very short time with basically all the key leaders around India. So last question. The pandemic will eventually, if not end, become less intense. We'll event, the, the lights will go back on. We'll go back to something like normal. What do you think you as a 
magician, as a performer, will take from this fraught experience and apply in your future performing? What have you learned that's worth hanging on to, do you think? Well, it's it's very, that's an amazing question because, um, first of all, I think virtual shows are here to stay, right? Because they're convenient and virtual meetings are here to stay because they're useful, right? And the other side of it, Okay, this gets into working on other platforms like Discord and Slack, which many many people know. But I'm, you know, I'm of the older generation, so I, I use those mediums. But actually, I love working on Discord because you're able to document the interaction in a whole new way, right? So you can basically create streams, working streams of information. So if I have a visual source that I want everybody to see, or if I have um, a recording, you know, even like I could put this link in and say, hey guys, listen to this. And so by the time we next uh, get together and discuss, then the, all, we've also built this record. And that, that I find really exciting. And I think that is a huge shift. And that will influence education and medicine, and it'll go right across the board. Let me thank you for the conversation today. Uh, you're pretty good in two dimensions. You're better in three dimensions, quite frankly, but you're pretty <laughs> good in two dimensions. So thanks a lot. Mark. A pleasure. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New Thinking for a New World podcast. We welcome your comments on our website, talbergfoundation.org. And please subscribe to the podcast in the app of your choice. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.